Thanks, Susan. So uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Panera. Uh, he's a full professor uh, of pediatric surgery here at McGill, uh, also a senior scientist uh, in the RI. He has multiple degrees, uh, including an MD, of course, uh, master's degrees in health professions education and international development, PhD in health strategy and management. He's funded by uh, the usual suspects, CIHR, FRQS. Um, he's the head of this commissar lab, which I'm interested to learn about. Um, also the director of the Jean-Martin Laberge Fellowship in Global Pediatric Surgery, founding member of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. He's well published, over 160 scientific papers, book chapters, um, supervises graduate students. So looking forward to this talk. I really, the title is very provocative, so I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody who took the time to, to join in. I'm looking forward to this. This is my first uh, first presentation um, on stage as a PI. And uh, um, yes, looking forward to, to share what, what we have and about our lab. Um, I'm, despite being having obviously no hair and uh, being senior scientist, I'm actually quite junior uh, in my research here in, at McGill. I've only joined uh, uh, McGill in 2017. So um, yes, I like to, to I titled this the voice to the voiceless because we are focusing on children and their families in the process of pediatric surgery. Um, in terms of disclosures uh, for 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 years, decades, I, I was envious of all those people that had disclosures because I never had any. But finally, I managed to get myself into a little startup. Um, it's really a um, student-led uh, McGill uh, startup, which is pretty well penniless, but I am the founder and shareholder, so I need to, to disclose that. Um, in terms of what, what I would like to do over the next uh, 40 minutes or so is introduce the lab, the commissure lab, so people see what it is, as an, really as an example of, of a platform for conducting patient-centered and patient-partnered research. Um, well, I'll outline the research agenda that I have in the current programs. Um, I've been told that these talks have to be methodology, uh, methods focused, so I will highlight some of the methodologies that we've selected for our questions. And really, I would like very much to have some time to hear from you uh, advice, suggestions, um, thoughts um, as I'm actually planning to take this to the next level, um, applying to my J2 um, this fall. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll go through the usual sort of whys, why is, why is there a need for the research and the questions that we, we have, uh, the where and who, that's our lab, the how, that's going to be the methods part, and then spend some time on the actual what's what are the studies and what are we actually doing. I thought I'll give one slide to my past life because, um, because I do believe that our present and future are always very much informed by our past and that definitely applies to my research. I can sort of, I've been around for a while as you can see, uh, many of you probably not born in 1993, but um, I've started, uh, I sort of have these three periods in my, in my research life. Started as young faculty in 93 at Queens and in Ontario. Um, and I was encouraged as a young sort of pediatric surgeon uh, uh, at uh, Queens to, to choose surgical education, both because it was an institutional need for me, that was the prompt, and because it, I was told it's going to help my personal career development, which actually it did. The outputs from that, that decade or so um, were my master's in health professional education. Involvement in something which most of you may not know, which is called FPO, Educating Phys Future Physicians for Ontario, was very big in the 90s. Um, that's, that was the group behind the CANMEDS um, competencies, physician competencies that we all use nowadays. 
Um, I worked quite a bit on undergraduate education, established some surgical objectives for the first time and got my little publications out of it. Then in 2003, we moved um, as a family um, long term to longer term to Africa, to East Africa, Kenya, and then Ethiopia. There I started doing research and the theme was very obvious. It had to do with global pediatric surgery. It was simply a result of the inequities that I faced practicing surgery, the pictures obviously from that period of time. Um, and uh, therefore all my research was really had a very, very, un I was very clear about the reason behind it. It was advocacy, advocacy for more resources, for, for, sur for surgery, for healthcare in low and middle income countries. Out of this period of time, I got my PhD um, and um, I was involved in the Global Burden of Disease Group, um, which, um, which, is, which is quite significant and continues to be in terms of producing yearly dallies and, uh, and specifically looking at burden of disease. Uh, started the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, which is uh, very much alive and well now. It's just a grouping of of providers, mostly from low and middle income countries that are spearheading um, pediatric surgery globally. Um, those were the main things. And then I came, I came actually in 20, uh, 2015 to McGill. Um, then in 2017, I, I got a position here actually, and um, then started, wanted to start research and applied for my FRQS. And uh, at the time, I sort of stopped and said, so what will I do? And I was afraid to continue in global surgery. I was afraid because I knew that it's very hard to conduct global pediatric surgical, global research. Um, and, uh, and I looked at, and it also came from a bit of reflection. I guess I had by that time already 25 years of practice. And I thought, what is it here in Canada? What do I see as being the real, the, the, the real um, needs within my specialty. And I felt it was patient-centered um, uh, patient centered research, and that's what I chose. So the prompt was really where the gaps that I found within my practice um, that, that resulted in questions which I wanted to ask and answer. In terms of outputs for this period, that's sort of fresh, just been three years in it. Um, this comes your lab, I'll mention a little bit about it. And then, um, and then the, um, the um, a bunch of grants, and more importantly, a bunch of grad students, which is very exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to, to, to have this. So, so the current research is really prompted by my practice. So I'll tell you a little bit about, about this field, which some of you may know, many of you don't. What's, what do we, what's the issue? in pediatric surgery. Yeah, it's kids and it's surgery, but like, what are our issues? Well, we deal with rare conditions, no question about it. Um, but I like those of you pediatricians, for example, who focus or others who focus on rare diseases, our diseases are never sort of straightforward genetic diseases, for example, or inborn errors or metabolism. They're always multifactorial uh, conditions uncertain etiology, and very much management that sort of evolves. And the severity of these conditions is also quite, quite different. Most of our conditions have very low mortality with one or two notable exceptions. The morbidity is also generally low, but when it is there, often it is long-term. And that's a big, important thing. Then, of course, we're dealing with kids. So we typically operate on them when they're very young, and then they change so much. And there's always this interplay between the child that's developing and their disease that's never stable either, which is very interesting and complex. The best part, or best or worst, depending on if you like children and their families or not, is the tripartite communication process. Instead of having the doctor and the patient or the healthcare team and the patient, we have the healthcare team, the child, and the parent. And then there's the interplay, of course, between the parent and, and the child. And the child's role in this tripartite uh, communication 
forever changes. It changes with every year. It changes by age, but it changes also based on the maturity of the child, the disease and the illness itself, a million cultural factors, all kinds of things that make it very, very interesting and very little known about it. And finally, we're all involved in a care which by definition is a sort of a high acuity, surgical, high value because of the parents whose precious possession is in our hands and high stress because of the because of the high value that parent, uh, parents put on their children. So these are the things about our profession. So, so this leads to some questions, at least these were some of the questions that went through our minds at that point in time. And it's, first of all, it's the big one was like, what happens with these kids who have had surgery and then they grow up? Do they still have problems? How long? How do these change? How do their parents deal with these problems? Um, how do we improve their care and not just get them through the surgery, but actually get them through childhood and adolescence? Then there was a big communication uh, question. How do we best communicate about surgery, about the risk process? It's called risk communication with both the children and the parents, not just the parents. Um, and then finally, how do we diagnose and better and manage better our conditions? How do we personalize the treatment when the diseases are rare? We don't have a lot of experience with them. Also, they're very different in their severity and their etiology is complex. How do we actually treat better? Because we have some very simple diseases which we don't know how to really personalize the treatment. So those are some of the questions. So that led us to the Commissure lab. Um, Commissure is obviously a play on words. It's communication and surgery, but, or communication innovation and surgery, that's the I, that's little, little red there. Um, but it's also the term that's used very often in anatomy and clinical medicine, the commissures, there's lots of commissures in the body. There's a commissure around your lips. There's a commissure in the spine and so forth. And that's an interface between two things. So we like to think of ourselves as a patient-centered and patient-partnered virtual research lab. And what we do is we explore, innovate, and improve what the communication between families and children facing surgery and the surgical team, as well as within the interdisciplinary surgical teams that we deal with. We started off when we when we started in 2018, we, we, we decided on what our values are. So somehow it just has to start with the values. And our first value is the fact that we are very much patient and family centered in our focus of inquiry. When it comes to how we run, we're very much student and trainee centered. And throughout all this, we are absolutely patient partner centered uh, based on the old um, uh, war cry of the disability movement in the 70s, nothing about us without us. We felt that patients needed to be from the beginning embedded in our lab as core researchers. We are um, intentionally and intensely collaborative and cooperative. We just can't do it without help, a lot of help we need. And we're very interdisciplinary and even cross-sectorial. Um, we're not talking about just being, being uh, partnering with, um, with uh, pediatricians. Uh, we're talking about partnering with engineers. Um, and we do that because we also are very enthusiastic about technological innovation, not because it's the bandwagon, but because it's just a great tool that we can use and it helps us in research. Um, we do believe in sort of being, sort of taking all kinds of risks and you'll see some of the projects that we've come up with are sort of risky uh, in terms of having outcomes actually out of them. Um, and within the lab, we definitely, you very much um, believe in the, in the right relationships among ourselves and in order to make this a safe and uh, a place for exploration and for growth. Who are the people in our team? 
Well, we have several teams. This is our division, our clinical division, the division, the Beardmore Division of, of uh, Pediatric um, Surgery. Um, and uh, many of our, many of the people here are part of our lab. Um, they're surgeons, they're nurses, um, they're administrators, and they're there. And I just wanted to recognize here the fact that much of the funding from the division comes through the uh, Mirel and Lino Saputo uh, Foundation, which funds our chair, uh, Dr. Emil, who's the guy in the middle in the gray suit, um, who's, um, um, who has a chair in uh, patient-centered medicine. Um, we have a large number of collaborators at McGill. You'll recognize many, maybe most of these uh, faces, won't call them out. Um, people that I've worked and I'm working alongside with. I just wanna give a shout out to Patty Lee because she's more than just a collaborator. She is my uh, mentor. And she took me through my, my FRQS and my CHR grants, so that's that. And uh, our team spreads well above, well outside the country and the um, and McGill. These are people that many of the faces you will not recognize, but they come. They are collaborators, researchers uh, from um, from across the country, from UK, from Nigeria, from US, um, from um, what else do we have? Um, that's probably the uh, the ones that are here. And then we have our graduate students. These are the ones that are, have been our past so far in these few years and the ones continuing right now. There's several joining us this year. And again, they also come from many places. Um, it was mentioned I do, um, some of them come through the fellowship in global surgery. And we currently have a, uh, a two Brazilian and one Nigerian um, uh, st um, student. We also had, uh, um, a Congolese student that graduated from our lab. So um, what's our focus? Our focus, we, we, we placed ourselves from the beginning at this interface, commissure, between families, surgical providers. And I said at the time, technology. It made for a very nice triangle, although I must say that uh, the more I think of it, technology is not an interface. Technology is just a tool. So we're sort of in between the patient and family and the surgical team. This is a little bit of the mishmash of um, projects which are actively happening here. Um, some of the green ones are more or less finished and published. The other ones are happening now. Way intentionally not, not um, um, uh, uh, um, possible to read this from the slide, not intended to do that. It does show, at the beginning, it shows, of course, industry, a fair number, a fair bit of work and activity, but also not very much of a focus. So I, I, I tried to re-visualize re this using the main themes in our lab, and I came up with this. Um, at least it shows the main themes here. You're going to see it's communication and pediatric surgery, uh, hearing the child and family voices, um, precision in pediatric surgery, and then there's this sort of side theme of global pediatric surgery. And this shows a little bit more the sort of flow of the research from one project to the other, and of course the meandering as we go along. But, um, but I'd like to go now and talk a bit about the methods and rather the methodologies that we're using. And I'm using here a framework which I really, really like um, from um, McGill's own um, Meredith Young, you may know her, um, published in Academic Medicine. Um, Meredith um, debunked the sort of known, known um, connection between separation between quantitative, qualitative data, where of course quantitative data are used in, uh, are used, uh, um, we use inductive approaches for that, while we use a deductive approach from methods, from theory to data, uh, for the uh, more for the sort of for the quantitative ones, while the inductive ones are used for the qualitative ones, like the traditional, like the grounded theory and, and, and so forth. And this shows that in fact it doesn't need to be like that. And the two are not do not move dependent of each other. They move independently, and we can have deductive and inductive processes 
both within the quantitative and qualitative um, groups. So I tried to use this to, to sort of plot a little bit our lab and where we are at. And these are the three themes. I'm leaving intentionally away aside global surgery because that's sort of not part of the current focus so much. Um, the themes, and I try to put them on these two scales, the inductive versus deductive and the qualitative and quantitative. And of course, this is extremely approximate and not even per totally, totally um, exact, but, um, but it gives us an idea. Our first theme is uh, that of communication. And uh, in communication, um, it's more about inductive, it's more about developing theory. Um, although there's lots of data that are also generated, of course, in this. So this is sort of halfway between qualitative and quantitative. The next two themes tend to be much more quantitative. I mean, that's why we're at core, uh, and uh, most of us do the quantitative stuff. Um, the patient-centered measures sort of are a little bit, we are using qualitative methods as well here. Uh, and then the third one, precision pediatric surgery, that's by and large quantitative, of course, and it is deductive. It's really about, about uh, generating data from theory. So what I'm going to do from here on is basically go through these themes and still to try to get um, to, to have a sort of an overall view rather than getting bogged into the details of different studies. I'm, I'm using this, this table um, and I wanna give credit here to Nancy Mayo who, who helped me put it together and it really helped me see really what we do. And you can see the themes and really what we wanna do, the agenda, the research questions, the methods we use and some of the uh, actions that stem from this. Um, Again, the first one is this communication bit um, where we want to improve the communication both between patients and their doctors and, and uh, within healthcare teams. So we have several research questions here. You can see um, we, are, we want to know specifically what are the factors that affect the quality of this communication. Um, obviously, answer such a question, it's a mixed method type type um, type uh, question often. And we're using, of course, surveys and interview families about this communication process. We've, we're spending quite a bit of time looking at the challenges and opportunities of implementing digital health application. And there's two of them, and I'll talk about both of these two. But because we do that, of course, we're going to use uh, methods like participatory design in terms of uh, designing this, and then evaluating these digital um, platforms using both non-randomized and randomized uh, trials. And the action there is developing and evaluating um, a mobile communication app and a virtual reality trauma simulation training module. And then we have another set of questions within this, which has to do with, um, with, um, non -co with communication skills in teams. And this is, the question is, do, if we provide feedback specific and directed to communication skills rather than normal technical skills feedback in trauma simulations, do we actually get better performance um, from trainees and other providers? And you'll see how, where that, this stream goes. The newer, a uh, topic that of hearing children's uh, and families' voices in pediatric surgery. This is the focus of our current uh, CHR uh, proposal that just went out, um, really implementing a platform where we can collect uh, patient report outcome measures, sorry, patient report outcomes and patient reported uh, um, experiences in children and follow these as the children age. Um, here the question is really what is the impact? of living with sequelae of surgical conditions for children, youth, and their families throughout childhood and adolescence. This will involve both cross-sectional studies as well as longitudinal ones. Uh, we'll be surveying first uh, children and families using individual prompts. We'll talk about that. And we'll also um, create a registry where we're gonna follow these children over their lifespan. And then finally, the third theme is that of precision pediatric surgery, where we're trying to make pediatric surgery 
more tailored, the, the, man, the diagnosis and the treatment of pediatric surgery more precise, more tailored to the patients uh, in order to get better outcomes, obviously. And, um, and that, um, the question, one of the questions there is, we're, gonna, we're looking at appendicitis and we're looking at machine learning there, trying to make it, the diagnosis more precise. So the question is to what extent our outcomes of appendicitis in children improved by using machine learning algorithms in comparison to statistical approaches. We're gonna use mod, uh, machine learning model development and validation for this. And we're gonna do the usual stuff that one does in this situation, uh, testing, training, and ultimately externally validating models that we have. So this is our lab. Um, I'll go through the, each one of these themes and uh, highlight some of the work that we've done or that we're doing, because a lot of it is still just happening. And in our first theme in the communication theme, uh, you see we have several studies. We're talking, we'll be talking about shared decision-making, uh, a lot of evidence synthesis. You'll notice actually right across a lot of evidence synthesis, um, uh, systematic and scoping reviews of the literature. We're looking at risk communication, um, um, which is the process of communicating around um, surgical risk. We're looking at the process of consenting uh, in pediatric surgery, we're looking at trust development. It's one of the risky ones. And then we've got the big app, uh, which we'll talk about here for communication. And then the non-technical skills or communication skills and trauma um, threat that I mentioned about. So here's some studies. Um, we first looked at shared decision-making in surgery. Uh, we want to know what's the situation. You always start in the field with this evidence synthesis. We found that yes, it exists. Uh, yes, um, definitely there is, there is increase, there's good outcomes that come from shared decision-making in surgery. You can see here the sort of blue increased knowledge for shared decision-making, increased decision satisfaction, shared decision-making is preferred. There's even better, more physician trust and time spent in this, so that's good outcomes. And we found the sort of methodologies that are being used for this, the type of, uh, what type of decision aids are used for sure decision-making, you can see, and they also are, show different positive impact on the processes, whether it's video paper or web and so forth. We then took it in a second paper where we actually took the decision aids and a subset of these papers, and we conducted a meta-analysis, which was pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Yes, you can see here that decision aids improve decision satisfaction, which is important in surgery because if we operate on you and you're not happy that we operate on you, that's just not good. Um, also, this, it decreases decision regret, and that's the big one in surgery you will be amazed to know that in some surgeries, up to a third of patients regret having had the surgery. That's not good. <laughs> so we found that out. And in terms of number of surgeries, some sure, in some cases, sure decision-making improved, uh, increased the number of surgeries, some decreased. That's because of what we wanted to do. In some places, we should operate less. In some places, we should operate more. So that was what the study showed. Then we looked, we had this survey study on the uh, family valued outcomes and communication preferences for children that undergo small surgeries, outpatient procedures. And you can see that our survey, we actually managed to get 368 patient families. So a lot of responses from there. Um, it was interesting. It was interesting. It wasn't a good differentiation of the outcomes in, the, <clears throat> in our scales. Um, but uh, for example, we found out that what are the aspects that we communicate, we as surgeons communicate well with our families well, we describe the surgery very well, um, and maybe we give them some, some uh, uh, instructions, but when it comes to, to debriefing with a doctor, not too many people thought that that was well done. And when it comes to aspects that, re that would benefit from improvement, the biggest ones, again, were the post-operative care, 
and the post-operative follow-up that we that we can get um, that we provided. So that was important important to know. It helped us as we're planning for our uh, mobile app. Um, and also, this is this was the pub, uh, this was the um, um, the publication. But we also found that um, there's various ways that patients like to communicate with us, and you can see it's pretty well sort of a spread of technology-based verbal, visual uh, stuff. Some of the written pamphlets, um, although clearly it was interesting, uh, post-operatively patients didn't want pamphlets. Pa post-operatively patients wanted to communicate, to connect to the doctor, which makes a lot of sense. Also in preparation for using technology for risk communication, we did the systematic review of um, artificial uh, intelligence and VR in the process of communication. What we were interested to know is how can this tool help us in communicating? And we found that there are four areas that were identified. You can see they're pretty evenly split. We use, um, we use uh, technology basically in risk communication as a decision support tool to help patients navigate choices. We use it to tailor patient information resources, very important. We use it to, in some specialties, they use it to visualize treatment like in computer imaging and like the 3D printed models and stuff like that. And we use it for training. And it's interesting because all of these areas are things that we intentionally built into our two technology platforms, both the VR uh, module and the, um, the AI, uh, uh, the, the uh, mobile app. Uh, another thing that we, uh, that we already started exploring is the consenting process between the, the informed consent process. We wanted to know what's happening in our specialty with that. So we did this, um, this um, um, scoping review that's being published now. And it was interesting because what we found, and it's sort of um, this visualization sort of shows this, that these are the areas that were identified by different stakeholders, as you can see, to be effective ways to get the consent done. We also had others that were ineffective. And what's interesting is who said that there are effective methods? For example, patients really would have liked to have multimedia for, for consenting, but uh, their doctors in yellow didn't think it was that important. On the other side, patients felt that having lots of time, adequate timing is very important. The surgeons didn't think it was that important. Isn't that precious? Stuff like this. This is what we found out about this. <clears throat> but then once we knew what the situation was, we decided to do something about it. And this is our current study. It's happening as we speak. It's a consent, it's a video consenting study. Our, um, our master student, Zoe, you can see her here, played a role of a very worried mother who interviewed, who was consented by five different surgeons, our friends, our colleagues, uh, Ken Shah is here in this picture, um, both representing a very simple hernia repair, but also very complex urgent neonatal problem. And then she recorded all this with their approval, of course. And then we will, we've sent this now to about 70 patients in various types of patients who have had exposure to surgery, didn't have exposure to pediatric surgery. And we're just getting the results back to see what they thought about these, uh, the, the consenting process. And we're also gonna be sending it to, start to other stakeholders um, and that's going to be very interesting to see what different people think about it. Our plan is to then um, modify the consents, redo some of these videos, and then use them, of course, as training tools. That led us to another big question I had, we had, and that is this whole trust me, I'm a surgeon thing. How do we develop trust with our patients? Um, I mean, it's very easy in, in, in family medicine. You see a patient over years and years over their blood pressure, they come to trust you. But for example, I see a patient on average 15 to 20 minutes total 
in one episode and then I operate on them. They better trust me when I operate on them. So we wanted to know what are the factors uh, of trust in the providers by patients and families and not just surgery. Here we actually expanded it to pediatric urgent settings and we're, we're, we're collaborating with the emergency room uh, department to do this. And we started with, a, with of course, the, uh, an, uh, an evidence synthesis, a scoping review uh, that we're finalizing now. And then we're gonna start with a survey and some mixed methods. We'll put some semi-structured interviews in there. Stay posted on what we find about that. Uh, the next couple of studies all prepared us for the mobile app. <clears throat> we wanted to know what the M Health or mobile health technologies are in pediatric surgery. We did a first study that we published um, on this, uh, which um, didn't have that many um, tools, but basically found that, yeah, seems like there's some, in some areas were really following up by using mobile health for, for follow-up really works and it's good. But then when we looked at the quality of the study in terms of overall bias, uh, we realized that they were not necessarily very good studies. So we can't really deduct very much from this. In fact, the whole study wasn't that great. So we're doing an, another larger study collaborating with Giulio Fiore from the IRR program <clears throat> where much larger scoping review uh, that looks at all these mobile apps in terms, not just in terms of outcomes, effectiveness, but in terms of feasibility, acceptability, availability. So that's happening as we speak. We also realized that if we're gonna run our app at the children's, we better know what the situation is in terms of our kids. Can they all use the mobile app? So this is the digital device study, which is happening currently at a uh, clinic close to you at the children's, uh, basically surveying the access to the mobile technology and readiness for mobile technology in our patients and their families. Um, we've already collected about 70 <clears throat> um, surveys. We're gonna go to, to over 100, but uh, we've already felt, uh, found some patterns. Uh, um, we found that it's about, every, all the time, it's about 20% of our patients do have difficulty accessing the internet, accessing mobile apps and so forth. So we will be able to, Focus on that group as we look at the at the feasibility and the and the actual use and and um, adoption of our um, app um, to try to improve to, to help them these families with um, the mobile technology. And then is the then it's the app. So we we did receive a very hefty um, fund funding grant from the Children's Foundation that allows us to do this over a period of four years. And the idea is to basically improve the experiences and the outcomes of children, um, uh, of children's care um, at, the, uh, um, at the children's uh, hospital. So we're planning to develop this AI powered application, uh, mobile application. We wanna demonstrate that it's gonna actually lead to better outcomes and a better experience of care, and then implement it across, um, across various departments. And we have quite a bit of buy-in already, even more. We started in surgery, but we actually changed the name of it from, um, uh, from um, journey of surgery to children's journey, because there's just so many, there are many departments that are interested and divisions that are interested in this, uh, in this thing. And uh, basically, um, the idea is to provide personalized information and patient education, of course, uh, not just available in the app, but available when you need it. Um, Opal is already doing an amazing job with providing patient education and patient information. Besides that, we wanted to ensure that we're gonna have absolutely fluid two-way communication between in various modalities, using texting, using emails, using various modalities, uh, calls and so forth between the families, post-op, especially and the healthcare team. 
And we wanted to make sure that because of the children's, there isn't just a patient a parent's app, that there is a companion children's app. Uh, you can see that we're planning to introduce it in various settings of both surgical and medical. There's different aspects of care which are particular to these settings, things like, such as enhanced recovery after surgery, so their surgical thing, ERAS, uh, or risk communication, while protocolized care is much more a pediatrics um, you, uh, feature. And shared decision-making, of course, is important in all settings. So that's what we wanna do with this uh, app. The app is because it's called a journey. Uh, it will include these milestones. So you, so you basically go from one milestone to the next, from the, in, in surgery, for example, from pre-op to the surgery, to post-op. And you can see here one of the screenshots. These are early screenshots of the actual app. And you'll see there, it's forget about cardiology surgery, but it is a journey with some milestones that have been completed. And then there's upcoming and later milestone. That's how the patients will, 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 that's how we will accompany the parents and the children through this stuff. Of course, we're not done very far uh, with this stuff. Uh, sorry, I should say that the app is just about out now in its alpha version and we're doing the testing as we speak and we hope to actually have a beta, uh, something that we can put in, in the hands of beta testers in a couple of months time. All right, um, going right along, um, I mentioned that we are looking at communication skills in teams, not just between the doctors and the patients. This is the, uh, the pediatric trauma uh, program and uh, um, Fabio is our PhD student that's working in this. Uh, he's looking at non-technical skills and um, that's in, in trauma. These are things such as communication, leadership, decision making. Um, he's using a design a debrief. He's going to design an actual debriefing tool for non non technical skills, phenomenal group process, and then evaluate its impact. And then what we want to do in this evaluation this is the this is the RCT uh, protocol that we're using and. Uh, and uh, we'll use medical students. Uh, we'll divide them in team members, as you can see here, and then um, randomize them to a control group who will simply be debriefed the way we do our debriefs after in teaching uh, using the standard format. And then the intervention will actually have specific directed non-technical skills debriefing, communication skills debriefing. And then we wanna see how they're gonna do in scenarios afterwards. That's gonna be a very interesting process. We are ready at the Sim Center to do this study and uh, we'll be running it at the actual study in May. Um, also related to the trauma, I mentioned that there's a virtual reality project that we have. Uh, this stems from the systematic review that we've, we've just finished where we looked at trauma courses. And what we found out is that they're very unaffordable in most places in low and middle income countries, primarily because they're based on mannequins and mannequins are very expensive and very hard to scale up and to use. So because of that, we realized that we wanna do something that we wanna to try to see if virtual reality can make trauma training be actually more scalable more affordable and more distributed without being in person. And that's the current uh, project. It looks quite futuristic, but uh, in fact, we use Star Trek um, uh, Bridge Crew as a game, as, a, as an idea behind it. But in fact, we have a team from the UK called AI Solve who are halfway through producing the first module, something that will look a little bit like the picture here um, that, um, that will be, um, will be um, um, then able to manage in real time a child through this, um, through this process. So that's another very interesting uh, process that we were involved in. I should just mention that in this, um, so, and that, that, that was a theme one, sorry, that was the longest one. I need to move a bit faster. So I have some time for questions. Our second theme is actually 
quite nascent, quite uh, happening as we speak. Uh, this is the patient-centered measures across the lifespan. The four projects that you see here, we have completed one of them, the PROM, the evidence synthesis part, the PROMS review, I'll show you that. The other ones are basically how we embark on this uh, CHR grant that would allow us to find what the patient reported outcomes and measures are across the lifespan. Uh, this is the PROMS study that we've already conducted and published. Um, and basically what we find in pediatric surgery is that there's a smattering of these measures, patient reported outcome measures in various conditions. Uh, a lot of them are in-house and most of them have been developed just in the last few years. There was real, uh, really scarce before. And really they're very much, uh, there, some of them are disease specific, some of them are generic, but there's no rhyme and reason for how they are actually made and none of them are individualized. And I'll mention in a second what that is. This is our, this is our CHR grant uh, proposal that we've just finished, what, a few weeks ago with help from many of you um, at CORE, uh, the PROP study, patient report outcomes in pediatric surgery. Basically, we're looking at, looking at these outcomes, experiences, but also health services or utilization and social determinants of health throughout childhood and adolescence. In these children, we have been operated at birth and then we follow them. And of course, in their parents as well. You can see that our, our first objective is to identify what are the domains that, that were, which matter to the children and their parents at various stages. So to do that, to find the domains, we needed to use individualized prompts. These are, these are, these are prompts which don't simply ask somebody uh, do you have trouble walking? Do you have trouble studying? They ask you, what do you have trouble in? And then it goes from there. So I'll, I'll show you one of those I prompts, individuals prompts, but we're gonna do this in a survey format uh, over a period of um, uh, using patients that have been operated on for quite a bit of time, over, over 17 years you see here, because they'll have different ages, of course. Then we're gonna use a nominal group process to, to, to select among the existing PROMs and PREMs, the ones that make most sense based on the domains that the children and their parents identify. And then we're gonna follow these things in a registry, which we're creating uh, that's gonna follow them over a period of time. And again, that's gonna be the longitudinal part. And that's also where we're gonna use, apply the health equity lens to, these, to this study. To give you an, an idea, these are the various tools that exist that we've chosen already, but not necessarily all of them to use because it would make the surveys way too long. And that's where we're gonna choose among all these, uh, these prompts available, which ones are the ones that really matter to the children and their families. This is what an IPROM or individualized PROM look like. Uh, this is the patient generated index. Um, um, Dr. Mayo's lab um, has worked with these and in fact, just created this child version of it. That's why we wanted to use this. Uh, basically, you don't tell, you don't ask the children what they have trouble, uh, if they have trouble in various areas, you tell them, you ask them, what areas do you have trouble in? eating what I want or whatever it is, they write it here, they score how important and how impactful these areas are. And then that's the precious stuff. They weigh these areas by knowing that they only have 10 gold coins or 10 chips, and then they can assign them anywhere they want, but they have to commit. They only have 10 chips for this. So that's what we're gonna use in our children. We're also gonna use a patient reported experience measures. And um, this one is uh, out of our, with our, in our collaboration with the Great Ormond Children's, um, Great Ormond Street um, Children's Hospital in, in London. Um, this is a beautiful patient reported experience measure that um, was not just created for kids, but actually with kids. And we have several formats for various ages for this, and we'll be using this. I mentioned that our lab is very much committed to patient uh, partnerships, and this is what you see here. In fact, uh, 
they are, we, ha we all, always had a patient council with several patient partners led by Elena, our, our um, lab manager, who's also the parent of three children with severe illness and multiple interventions. And, uh, but we involve our patients, we're planning to involve them in all aspects of the study from reviewing the project aims to the methods, to the survey, uh, survey results, co-developing the surveys, interpreting them, disseminating. We also work with the Quebec and the Canadian Center of um, um, Excellence in, in Patient Public Partnership. Um, we've already worked on the previous grants with them. And in this picture, besides me, that's recognizable, and my dog, the other ones are patient partners. I mentioned that there are some projects that we will, we want to continue to move in. Uh, and these are basically when once we establish these patient reported outcomes and experiences, we want to look specifically intentionally to the health trajectories for all these illnesses that we're following, the four or five congenital illnesses that we're following. And out of that, the right transitions and identify what are the transitions in care. And with that, hope to actually make changes and create interventions to improve the, ultimately the outcomes of these children. That's the future. And then finally, the, the, final, the last theme is that of precision pediatric surgery. Uh, we have four projects um, uh, here currently. Um, some evidence synthesis, as you can see, and then some, mat some model development um, that I want to mention about. Um, precision communication is a, is a topic which is not defined yet. So we actually are finishing a scoping review, which allowed us to come up with some definition for what precision communication, as opposed to precision diagnosis, precision therapeutics, what does it mean? And we came up with with that definition of personalization of communication to patients. Um, the main uh, thing it will be, uh, we're looking at using technology for prediction, for machine learning uh, me methods for clinical prediction rules. And we did a systematic review on this one to figure out what the current status is. But what we're doing through the CHR grant is basically aimed to improve the diagnosis of perforated appendicitis. And basically we will, we will use machine learning for this. We've got a retrospective cohort. We're gonna train our model in this using the perforation grade, which is something we developed locally uh, and see the, what factors impact on the correlation on the perforation grade from the various measures preoperatively and then use this to validate the algorithm and externally validate it over time. Uh, the importance of this study is that, is that currently we have many ways to treat appendicitis, but we operate on everybody because we have no other option because we don't know before the surgery what type of appendicitis they had, what perforation grade it was. This model hopefully will bring the diagnosis before the surgery so that we can actually personalize the treatment. And we're also playing with some natural language processing to, to, to speed up the process of reading ultrasounds and pathology reports and so forth. So that's just another side project. And the idea here, these are the last two areas where we're moving with this, is to, identify, to basically lead to precision diagnosis and treatment of appendicitis. And also we're partnering with a group out of Calgary, which is using multi-omics, various bioprofiles for the diagnosis of appendicitis. And we hope to merge our two studies using machine learning for various clinical factors and adding the bioprofiles to actually come to precision um, treatment of diagnosis and treatment of appendicitis. So that's what I had. This is the way forward just to say from all these projects, a lot of it, what you've seen here is exploration. We want to move from exploring these things to actually improving, obviously. So changing, moving from questions like, what is patient-centered care? What, is, what are risk communication preferences? To, to what extent can transitional interventions improve health trajectories? Or provider and trainee educational interventions improve the experience with healthcare? or a VR-based 
uh, trauma module actually improve performance and clinical outcomes. That's where we're going. It's a long way, but we're just starting on this. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if, I'd love to have any questions if there are any. Thanks. That was a really impressive research program and scope. Uh, so I'll, there's already some questions, so uh, I'll pass it to Sa Sasha. Thank uh, you. So I'm an adult physician, and, and uh, I think on the pediatric side, sometimes that you, you have a different volume, but probably in trauma and surgery, you still have to suffer from the same kind of uh, pressure of time that, that adult, adult physicians um, feel. And I see in some of what you're doing, the ability to maybe um, make things more efficient, because my thought process is when you start talking about, for example, the, the, the um, patients, um, patients want more time spent with them when they do from consent and physicians don't, of course, think it's a problem. But, but, but the reality is that uh, physicians are already, they don't really have enough time to do everything they need to do. So, so some of, I can see what I was going to ask you, um, how, if you thought about, you know, the data that you're producing, what you'll want to do to change in the process of care that would make things more efficient, free up uh, patient uh, doctor time, or do you see the shared care being different such that maybe nurse practitioners do consenting? I see. Um, no, I don't think we need to pass it on to the, uh, uh, to, to, part, to other practitioners. I think it is our responsibility. I do, I do believe that, uh, that um, uh, technology can help us. And in fact, within the app that I talked about, currently the focus is more on the post-op care and personalizing that. But in fact, we want the app to have much of the information that's necessary for bringing the information to the, to the provider for the, the consenting process. And actually using a reinforcement learning to give patients information that they actually want to make the decision. Because what I do now when I consent a patient for hernia, I go through my spiel, which it, I've done for 30 years. And it's sort of, it takes 10 minutes and I say this, 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 this. Half of the stuff probably the patient doesn't care about, doesn't want to know. And I'm wasting time, both of our times doing that. So what we can do through reinforcement learning through the app is actually to identify the bits of information that the patients want to hear and present it to them so that there's less talk and more understanding in the process. Remember that it's actually, this process is not about just changing and conveying information. It's about trust development. That's all that matters ultimately to me is not what I say, is the trust of the patients and I need to be in that process and I need to spend a minimum amount of time in that. Okay, um, I have a question if no one else does. So uh, thanks again for this talk. So I, two things came up during your talk. One is um, just high level, your, your program focuses on sort of PROMs and PREMs and surgery. Um, and I think from a very naive, perhaps old school perspective, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, the perspective was if the surgery is done well, there's no short-term surgical complications, then that's a success, end of story. Do you, is, there, is there knowledge or literature on, I guess, the patient's perspective with respect to, there's that technical component, the surgery was done well or not well vis-a-vis -vis short-term surgical complications, infections or dehiscence or whatever. And then there's everything else, like the building that trust, the that alliance, the communication, the consent, the before and after, like all of that in the long term, has anyone tried to quantify or is it even quantifiable how much uh, the technical aspects versus all those other aspects matter to the patient's experience and perceptions of, of, of the surgery or the illness? Like, I wouldn't be surprised, I guess, having heard you speak and thinking in my own space of like, adult diseases, I think a lot of the patient's experience has to do with those other factors, not the technical thing, no disrespect to surgeons. <laughs> but is that like a, a well-known thing or is that what you're exploring? It's known, it's not well-known, but it's totally known. 
Um, it came out, for example, in, in some trust studies. They've shown that patients trusted doctors who had complications more than the doctors who didn't. Of course, it makes sense because when I have a complication, I'm gonna spend a lot of time with that patient to make sure that they're okay and they don't sue me. But in fact, it is very much, um, much more important is the, is the long-term stuff that happens. But remember also the PROMS and PREMS, it's not about the surgery. I mean, for right. congenital stuff, I mean, we do this esophageal treatment, all this fancy surgery, but then they live, they live for, for a decade or two with pulmonary uh, limitations, with, with intestinal limitations, with neurological deficits and so forth. So, so there's so much more broader, it's much more medical than we as surgeons would like to think about. Mm -hmm. For the ones that matter, I mean, a hernia, I fix it, goodbye, never see that patient again. Mm -hmm. But that's not the frontier in pediatric surgery. The frontier is the children with major con congenital malformations, unique ones, what happens what happens to them in the lifespan, in the lifespan. Thanks. So I guess since we're at time, I'll, I'll save my other question related to AI. Uh, maybe I'll catch you in the hallway at core. Um, others, that, there's just other ex expressions of great presentation, really interesting talk. The, um, Janet Rennick will, will also follow yeah. up with you. Uh, so again, thanks again. That was really, really- uh, Dr. Schwartzman has his hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that, Kevin. Uh, oh, no worries. Kevin. Yeah, that's, sorry. Thank you for an amazing presentation. Uh, my first question will probably be how many hours you have in your day, because it seems to be different from from some of us. But that's <laughs> that. That, that we'll I don't do that my one. surgery. I don't do my surgery. <laughs> I love this stuff. <laughs> but but leaving that aside, um, just very quickly. I mean, it strikes me that that some of the issues that you 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 grapple with, like all of us, are are also sort of systems issues in terms of where incentives lie, where they don't lie, and I don't mean just financial incentives, but others. So for example, I think you know the point about uh, patients and families wanting more time to be spent uh, in the post-op setting, uh, I can certainly relate to that as, uh, as a family member of somebody who's undergone surgery recently. But at the same time, I, I feel like the sort of quote unquote system is 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 stacked against that. And, and many of the levers are actually not under, you know, sort of easy, easy control or an easy fix, right? I mean, and I don't even mean financially. I mean, for example, it's difficult for any surgeon uh, to spend much time post-op when she or he is, is, has to deal with things in the emergency room and, and, and uh, is under pressure to, and, and, and of course, and her or his time is best spent operating in terms of where their, their skills and expertise lie as well. So I'm just sort of, wondering to what extent you bring in these kinds of health systems issues beyond uh, what patients, families, and individual providers would want or ideally prefer and so on. Well, I absolutely, excellent question, Kevin. And I mean, I absolutely had to address this because nobody will give me money to do anything that's gonna cause the hospital, the poor hospital to have to spend more, more money or my poor colleagues uh, to have to spend five more minutes with their patient. We're, we're just trying, what we're trying to do with the app, for example, is simply to turn things on their head and, and to say, well, at the end of the day, if our patients don't get the information they need and their little kiddo has a major problem two days post-op and they have no way to contact us, they're gonna come to eMERGE. We can calculate how much in resources that costs, or they're gonna call us at night and we don't like that to happen. The actual communication in the app is not going to happen. We're going to use our nurse, who's our clinic nurse, that already is getting every morning lots of emails from patients. Instead of getting lots of emails, she's going to have the app open in the dashboard in front of her, and she's going to answer the concerns, most of them very easily herself, and then, of course, uh, passing on to us, to the various providers, the rest of the stuff. So at the end of the day, plus I don't need to spend 15 minutes doing my spiel after each surgery because it's in that app so that I can just focus with a patient on just reassurance, everything's good, feel good about it, the information is right there at your fingertips. That's the idea, we'll see if it works. <laughs> Super, thank you. Okay, so thanks once again to everyone uh, for attending and also to Dan and to Susan. Have a great day. Thanks very much.